And so it's in, it's in that. I, I say, let's go to Luke 1 and just talk for a couple minutes. We're, we're just going to spend a few minutes in Luke uh, talking about what Christmas is about. And, and we introduced this last week. We said uh, the next three weeks, so last week, this week, and next week are, are what we're kind of calling Advent, which is it's just a word means coming. It's the anticipation, the thinking of the fact that Jesus came. That that's what Christmas is about. That it was the anticipation of Jesus. And in that, we said, you know, that the reality is in our culture, our society, there are a whole lot of things that we've begun to sort of define Christmas by. A whole lot of different things that you can get to when you think of Christmas. And depending on how your upbringing was or what your background is, that might look different. It might be about shopping and gifts and consumerism and, and stuff under the tree and opening your presence and uh, it might be about uh, for me it was like the three F's right family but then mostly food and football and you were just gonna you're gonna come together you're gonna eat you're gonna watch some sports or play some sports it might be about uh, Christmas programs it might be about those type of things but the the reality is we said that doesn't define Christmas that's that's stuff that surrounds Christmas Sa Santa Santa and trees surrounds Christmas right it's it's a part of it Good, bad, or indifferent, but it's, it's not defining it. And then I'll add to that also, you know, for, for those of you who have, have grown up and have a very deep-rooted church culture in your life, that drive through nativities and kids' programs and, you know, non-biblically accurate nativity scenes where the, the camels and the, the magi are there and, uh, it, you know, they really didn't show up until two years later, that, that doesn't define Christmas either. That's a part of it. That's a part of it. But it doesn't define it. You see what we said last week, and I want to continue and just kind of press into this week, is that Christmas is defined by the coming of Jesus. Christmas is defined by the grace and mercy of God, that God had such great love for his creation, for us, for humanity, that he came to earth, that he became a man. And what I want to focus in and look at today is that he didn't even become a prominent man. He didn't even come to earth in a really awesome and high and exalted way. In fact, it was the absolute opposite of that. And we heard some of it in the Christmas story. Let me, let me read it together and we'll look at it and, uh, and simply make the point that this is a time where we look and see God's manifested mercy for mankind. Verse 26 says, Now in the sixth month, the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, uh, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now let's kind of focus in on these next few verses. I want to talk about them for a few minutes. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you found favor with God. And then verse 31, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and his name shall be Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. The angel comes to, to Mary. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Mary. Uh, she is a woman, okay? And, and that's significant. That's significant because in the culture, women were of almost no value. They didn't have the right to vote. They, in fact, they couldn't testify in court because they were deemed not reliable, second-class citizens. They were insignificant, frankly. Uh, Jewish men at that time used to begin prayers, thank you God that I'm not a Gentile or a woman. 
Not only was she a woman, but she was from Nazareth. The, the Bible says it's the city of Nazareth, and that's a, as generous a term as you can find. Be the city of Darlington. Nah, that'd be it, probably less than that, right? It'd be like uh, the city of Wyota. Anybody from Wyota? Don't, don't get mad at me. All right. <laughs> Nazareth was off the beaten path. It was a nothing town. There was nothing significant, no, nothing significant about it at all. At that time, the, the center of the world would have been in Rome. The center of the Jewish world would have been in Jerusalem. Even the, the prophecy about a Savior to come was in this little town of Bethlehem, not Nazareth. Later, God would orchestrate and change the minds of rulers and kings so that he could fulfill prophecy in that way. But it's an insignificant woman in an insignificant town of insignificant heritage. And the Lord of heaven and earth sends his angel Gabriel to tell her she'll conceive a son. He'd be born of such humble beginnings that it'd be hard to even quantify it. In fact, last night as, as I was looking upon what was happening in the nativity, I looked up. And I don't, I don't know if you were out there last night, you had a chance to just simply look up. But the sky was clear and just filled with stars. One of the, it's one of those nights where you can see the galaxy, right? The, the cloudiness of the Milky Way galaxy. The stars everywhere. These little dots in the sky. And I thought, those are billions and trillions of miles away. Light years away. The vastness of that is just, it's just incredible. It's beyond our comprehension to think about that. To think about just how, how big our world is and then to go beyond that and say our, our entire world is part of this solar system orbiting one of these stars and that there are just more than we can count in the sky. That it is that big. And yet in that, there's a God who is big enough to hold all of those things together. And in that vastness, in that glory, in that majesty, in how big he was, he decided to come and be born of a virgin woman of no prominence, no, no uh, earthly authority or majesty, in a town that by and large just didn't matter. He certainly could have come down with a great deal of fanfare and glory and power. In fact, the Bible talks two times of the coming of Jesus, and the second is much different than the first. The second, he comes in a little bit more like what he is and the glory he's due, riding on a white horse, eyes like flames, tattoo on his thigh, robe dipped in blood. Instead, this time, he comes in humble beginnings, born of a virgin woman. Christmas is about the grace of God. That he who was in the beginning. Jesus, in fact, in his ministry is going to look at the religious leaders and go, before Abraham was, the guy that, that you call Father Abraham, I am. I was there. Paul's going to mention Jesus and say he was the firstborn of creation, the, the authority over creation, that in him all things were created. He's the head of powers and rulers and authorities, that it was created through him and for him, that in him all things hold together, that, that Jesus is God. <coughs> And yet, in his grace, his mercy, his love for us, chose to humble himself to the level of empty insignificance. And in the book of Philippians, Paul the Apostle is going to write that not only did he do this to be born, to be made in the likeness of men, to be made low, but he became obedient and emptied himself even to the point of death, death on a cross. That, that Christmas is the beginning of a life that's going to end in his death for us, that he was going to die so that he might save us. And so this, this week, this season, this time of year, we celebrate not simply because uh, a baby was born, but because that baby had existed since the foundation of time. 
Because that, that baby holds the universe in his hands. That baby is the, the fullness of the glory of God. And yet in his grace and mercy and love for us, he was willing to be made a man to experience pain and to experience death so that he might give us life. That's what Christmas is about. And so, so the way I want to uh, kind of spend the rest of our time tonight is, is, or this morning is just to ask, how do you respond to that? What are we meant to do with the idea that, that this time of year, this thing is about the just unbelievable measure of God's love and grace for us. And this is a simple answer. But it's to respond the way that Mary responded. To be like her response. Look at what happens. She says to the angel, how can this be since I'm a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative, who has also conceived a son in her old age, and she who was called barren is now in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. And look what she says. Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So Mary says, I, I'm yours. I'm, I'm your servant. Let it be done to me. And just to know that she's not begrudging about this or it isn't like, a, oh, okay, if you say so. Just a few verses later, Mary begins to sing. In verse 46, she says, My soul exalts the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior for he has had regard for me in the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed for the mighty one has done great things for me. And holy is his name, and his mercy is upon generation after generation towards those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arms. He has scattered those who are proud in the thought of their hearts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones. He has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, and he has sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. Mary is both accepting, submitting to the Lord, and trusting him. That's how we're meant to respond. Now, now before we kind of dig into that, let me give you uh, just a, what I think has become in our, our culture, our church age, our society, a really important disclaimer about this. And, um, and I, don't, I don't do well at not being blunt, so I'm just going to talk straight with you. Uh, Mary is a sinner. You might find, uh, depending on what tradition you've grown up in, that someone might tell you from the descendants of Eve that God chose the Virgin Mary to be the mother of his son, full of grace and the most excellent fruit of redemption. From the first instant of her conception, she was totally preserved from the stain of original sin and she remained pure from all personal sin throughout her life. You might have heard that. That's dogma. That's, that's what's written down as a doctrine and it's simply false. Uh, let, me, let me give you a little history lesson and tell you how that goes. In verse 26, 27, 28 of Luke chapter 1, the angel Gabriel comes to Mary and says, Greetings, O favored one. Well, a few hundred years have passed by. A guy named Jerome comes along and translates the Bible into Latin. It's called the Vulgate. He mistranslates the word, O favored one, into full of grace. Little mistranslation doesn't really bear any real consequence for a long time. That's 400 or so AD. Hundreds of years go by. Christians all around the world know that Mary was someone who knew the grace of God because she was given a gift in the Son Jesus the same way we are and so in need of his redemptive grace and was a cl very clear and close witness of it that she was full of grace that she had received a great measure of grace as we have. Mid-1850s, a guy comes along named Pope Pius X. 
and decides that full of grace didn't mean that she was a recipient of grace, but a dispenser of grace, and therefore must be without sin. She must also uh, cooperate through free faith and obedience in human salvation, that she would be a co-redeemer with Christ. The problem with that is the Bible, okay? So let me, just, let me just read this to you. Mary's not sinless. In fact, Jesus himself, looking at someone who called him good, says, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. In Romans 3, Paul writes of this. He says, none righteous. No one seeks God. No one is good. She is not the co-redeemer of mankind. She does not participate in rescue. That's the job of Jesus Christ. Paul writes in Colossians that he rescued us from the domain of darkness. He transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom, in him, in Jesus, we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins, him alone. Mary is not the interceder for us in prayers. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. Our intercession is through Christ and Christ alone. Okay, so, so let me just, that's as, as straightforward as I can be. I'll just read it and tell you they're wrong. And then I'll tell you why the Bible says it's right. And, and so you, you have to be careful with that. All right, if, if you're having some tension with that, or if you, you kind of have grown up in the Hail Mary full of grace type of tradition, um, you, can, you can come talk to me. You can talk to me afterwards. Uh, you, I always will let you buy me lunch, and we can have a good conversation about it and have some fun, but I think it's important that you know that, know the historical progression, know that for years, 1,800 some years, all Christians knew with a great deal of confidence that Mary, like us, is a sinner in need of the grace of God through Jesus Christ and that she is full of grace because she was the, the one of the very first to see and receive and know God's grace in her son Jesus Christ who came to redeem all of us to save us from our sin that's why in her prayer in her song she says my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior because she needs saving just like we do all right so just going, all right? So let's, let's talk about what Mary does, what she says in response to this, okay? So the first thing she does is in verse 38, she says, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. The first thing she does is, is she decides it's, it's not her will, but God's will that will be done. And let's not, let's not lose sight of how significant and consequential and not necessarily good consequences that she's about to face for this. She's a, a virgin engaged. Engaged in that time wasn't a romantic thing. That was a legal binding agreement. So Jews would get engaged. There was normally a payment of some sort and they would spend a year in what was legally the first stage of marriage. They wouldn't consummate that marriage. They wouldn't have relationships but she was legally becoming the property of Joseph. A year down the road they would be married and in what we term marriage they would be together but at this time they hadn't known one another. And so it's quite possible. In fact, you might think about it and say it's quite likely that to go to your future marriage husband who has, has paid a dowry, who is set to be with you and say, I'm pregnant, but it was the Holy Spirit. Might be a little tough. Amen? I mean, you might struggle. I might struggle to believe that a little bit, right? Like, where was that like a Friday night out on the town, Holy Spirit kind of thing? Or what, you know, what happened here? Not only that, but in that time, an adulterous woman could legally be stoned to death. Her very life is at risk. And in this, she says, I'm yours. I'm yours. How are we meant to respond to the grace of God? We're meant to give up us. We're meant to be His. We're meant to not trust in us. We're meant to trust in Him. 
You're meant to look at the fact that God in his grace and mercy and love for you sent his son to earth to die and say, it's not mine anymore. This life isn't mine. You take it. I'm your bond slave. I'm your servant. And let the chips fall where they will, but I want to be yours. That's what Mary does. And then, look at what she does beyond this. This is, this is where I think it really connects. Because maybe there's some of you in here, some of you who would go, yeah, that's, that's what I want to be. I've, I've believed in Jesus for, for a great portion of my life, and, and that's a motivating and inspiring thing. And say, yeah, I, I want to give myself to him. I want to I be a bond slave of his. I want to be, be his. I understand the grace and mercy. Let me, let me give myself to him. But I also know there's, there's some of you in here who... I haven't got that far. Not at that spot. Look at, look at the other thing that is happening in Mary's life. In fact, um, I think it is why she's able to say, I am yours, God. I trust you. Because Mary has humbly placed her faith in God. Verse 47 says, My spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he regarded my humble state. Verse 49, he has done great things for me. If you move down to verse, 40, or verse 53, he says, He filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. Here's the condition of Mary's soul. She's recognized God's mercy and she trusted it. I, I don't know where everybody's at this morning. My best guess is that it's all across the board. Some of you have, have bought in wholeheartedly. Hook, line, and sinker are ready to go, want to serve God in light of his mercy. Some of you uh, are, are just, just here to support a friend or a family member, and that's, that's good, that's cool. And maybe you're a little bit skeptical of that truth. The reality is what saves Mary is the same thing that saves us. It's that she believed, she had faith, she trusted in the grace and mercy of God manifested to us in His Son, Jesus. Born insignificant in a humble state. Lived for 33 years without the sin that each and every one of us experienced. And then died died taking upon God's wrath not not wrath towards him wrath that was meant to be poured out on us consequences for all of our shortcomings all of our wrongdoings and Jesus who had come to earth said give it to me and there dies so that we might have life so that by doing what Mary did, by trusting, by having faith in his grace and mercy, we might know God, have life in a relationship with him. That's what Christmas is about. Pray with me. Lord, there's a, a lot going on this time of year. A lot of stuff. A lot of things all around our lives. A lot of experiences for us. You see, some of us uh, have great, great joy and emotions and, and fun things about to happen in the upcoming week. Spending time with family and seeing people and enjoying that. Others of us uh, are about to walk into time of immense pain, trial, depression, knowing that our family isn't really what it should be or, or mourning the loss of someone or, or trying to understand why it, it doesn't feel, it doesn't look the way that it does on the, the Christmas cards. Some of us are going to get so wrapped up in everything around us. 
I pray, Lord, that we don't miss what this is about. That this is about the King of the universe, you, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, giving up yourself. That Jesus came to earth, living to die, not with prominence or fame or status, but emptied himself, humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death on a cross so that by trusting in him we might have life. By simply believing in his name we might have life. And so I don't Everybody's at this morning, Lord, but I pray that you would be moving in souls. That you'd be doing a great work here, and that we would get to rejoice in your glory, pictured in your grace and love and mercy and death on a cross. Lord. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.